Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you back to my channel where I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids without a greenhouse or grow lights or humidifiers, just me and them inside or outside or not at all. So plant lovers, if that sounds like your kind of conditions, do hit subscribe. I post every week on a Friday, hashtag complete amateur. Take everything I say with a grain of salt. It's really the musings and ramblings of how I've managed to figure out how to care for orchids in my conditions which is the reason I started the channel, because I found it quite hard to find information about how to grow orchids in my conditions. Which is a very nice segue to these two plants here. How do you grow orchids in my conditions? Sometimes not very well. So this video is a sort of, well, there are many aspects to this video. The first thing is I've recorded it before and the sound failed. The second thing is I made a video about unboxing this, which was over a year ago, which I never used in a video. So I'm gonna link that further down as we progress through the narrative <laughs> as to why this is important. So that was well over a year ago when we were still in lockdown. Goodness me, what a flashback that was. And then last summer, I did a video about the summer period of growth of these types of orchids, which I also haven't used because I was going to try and do a cyclical video about them blooming and the success and how fabulous I am at growing them. Guess what happened? Nature intervened in my lack of knowledge, skill and talent, and we had some disasters on the road. So this, plant lovers, is quite an epic narrative arc. But let's start at the beginning, just in terms of what these two are and the sort of the type of group they're from. It's basically that catacetum type of orchids and all the intergenerics and the hybrids that have come from that and a couple of other species. So this one is Cloessia Penang Waltz. Hashtag number one. I don't know if there's a hashtag two, three, four. Anyway, that's that one. Oh boy, do we have a story about this. And this one, is a Fred Clarkiara, and this is called Midnight Lace. You can gather perhaps that the flowers of this are very dark. Anyway, plant lovers, so I've had these for a couple of years and they have a very specific life cycle. And I'm not 100% sure that my climate is the right one. It could just be me. Maybe people can make them work in a similar climate. So firstly, I would love to know your stories and experiences of growing this type of group of orchid in my environment. So cold, wet winters, hot, dry summers, a mix of growing them indoors and outdoors. That's what I'm doing. But anyway, let me tell you what I've been doing and then we will go from there. So firstly, the species origins of all of these sort of hybrids, I think there's three or four, they are all South American. So from Mexico all the way down, I think as far as Argentina, the north of Argentina, there's lots in Brazil. As you can imagine, that is a large expanse of land and very, very, very different environments from high altitude to not to coastal to not. So all manner of different environments for the species, all of which DNA blends to make these hybrids. So it's quite a mix. So I think there are some general rules about the care of this type of orchid, which we'll go through. Of course, the big asterisk is, I have not got any of these to flower, and in fact, nearly killed them all last year, which is really the point of this video. Firstly then, a bit of an overview of the life cycle. They, in spring-ish, will send up a new growth like this from dormant pseudobulbs like this. Now, when that growth is about so big-ish and it already has developed roots, which you'll be able to see, it's time to repot it. It then grows like the clappers and it has sort of three to four months to mature, produce all this leaf growth and produce a really sizable pseudobulb to give it all the energy it needs for its next year's growth, etc., etc. So there's a lot going on in a short period of time, which means they need a lot of food and water when they're in that growth spurt, but not before. So then we do all this growth in an ideal world. We then bloom. Some of the hybrids will bloom multiple times towards the end of the season, depends on the hybrid. Your leaves will then start to turn yellow and the orchid will go into dormancy as you come into the cooler weather. That's when you really basically start dialing down the water and then stop completely. And I don't know about you, I do find it quite difficult to completely stop watering anything, but with this type, it's really important. Unless the pseudobulb starts to shrivel horribly, in which case water it once and it'll ping back again. So then you wait, you wait until spring when you get your new growth again and the whole process begins again. The key is not to water them when they're dormant because they can rot, which is a nice segue to what happened to mine. So they like very strong light, verging on direct light, so kind of Cattleya conditions, 
So what I do in spring, once the nighttime minimums are higher than about 10 degrees, so higher than sort of 55 degrees Fahrenheit, I move mine outside so they get plenty of air movement, plenty of moisture, plenty of humidity, and as much light as I can give them outside. So I literally am hosing them down most mornings and I'm liquid feeding them a couple of times a week and there's a lot of slow release fertilizer in the mix. Then the trick is of course to bring them inside before the nighttime minimums get too low. And what I did this year was I just left them out too long. Now, what you can see on this one, can you see that sort of brown girdle around the, um, the pseudo bowl? I left them out too long and I left them moist and there was moisture in the leaf joints and all, all of the pseudo bulbs started to rot immediately. And I had had maybe about five of this type of orchid so what do you do? You panic, ha <laughs> uh, ha Brought them all inside, I cut off the leaves and I gave them a systemic fungicide spray. I thought, that's all I can do. Luckily, for all of them bar one, it actually stopped the rot. It stopped the rot from progressing. So I didn't lose the pseudobulbs. And my thought was, if the pseudobulbs are still healthy enough to maintain all the energy, they'll still have the life force the next spring to send up growth. And I have been, Hashtag blessed, and that is just what happened. Apart from one which unfortunately didn't make it. So the moral of that story is when they are going into dormancy, just make sure that you are really pulling back the moisture and there is no moisture gathering in any of the sort of nooks and crevices of the leaf joints that could trigger rot in your pseudobulb because that's what happened to me. And this type is quite prone to rot when they are going into dormancy or in dormancy. All right, let's now move on to this one. This one is called Clawesia panang Waltz, as we've said. Oh, you know what I'm gonna do? I am actually gonna go back in time to when I unbox this and you can all witness my unbridled enthusiasm. And then what you might notice is there's only one pseudobulb. Off we go. But today, yes, we are still in lockdown in Melbourne. And look, the very lovely post has brought me another box of something which is an orchid, which kind of leads us to a whole piece about experimentation. So firstly, let me open this and it will explain this, which looks like a dead stick, but it's not. Okay, here we go. Let's see what we've got. Aha, ta-da, look at that. <laughs> I know it doesn't look very thrilling, but you can see the family resemblance, can't you? Okay, the orchid in my box of delivery is a Cloesetum Panang Waltz. Now, what I want you to do, your homework, is to Google this and just look at the flowers and you will perhaps die and go to heaven and understand why I bought this. Now, plant lovers, I hope my other half isn't watching this because I have a terrible, well, it's not a terrible confession. It's in lockdown, I'm struggling. I paid a lot of money for this. Now, oh, it's one of those tricky things, isn't it? What is something worth? What is something not worth? It's all about, of course, can you afford it? And what's the relative worth to you? I must say, I'm not kind of one for spending a huge amount on plants because there's a chance it could die. There's a chance you might not like it. There's a chance it might not thrive, all of the above. It just seems a little bit wrong to spend vast amounts of money on plants. Anyway, there are things that are rare and wonderful and people do spend lots of money. And who am I to say, because plant lovers, I'm gonna tell you that I spent $110 on this. Oh. I know, I know, shoot me now. Anyway, and look at it, three sticks. <laughs> but no, if you know Clarecetum, you will know that it is dormant in winter and this baby is just waiting to burst forth with extraordinary vigor. So this brings us to this baby here and why I have bought this one. Now this is a type of orchid called Fred Clarkiara and it's a mix between three different types of orchid, Catacetum, Colwessia, Mormodes, and Clawesetum is a mix of two of those. And the thing is, these have the most amazing flowers. And I was a little frightened of them because they've kind of got some strange behavioral tics, <laughs> like the best of us. But the first stage of this has gone well. And I thought, oh, look, why not? Why not just spend $110 on something you might kill, but has amazing flowers? 
So these things have been hybridized to produce amazing flowers, multiple blooms during the year, and some, in some cases, fragrance and incredible colors. Now this particular one is called After Dark, and it's quite a dark flower, strangely enough. So the thing is, as you can see, they're deciduous in winter. So they have leaves, which can be quite large and beautiful. Those leaves die off, and you're left with these sort of raw pseudobulbs, which then produce a new shoot, which produces green leaves, but the old pseudobulb stays leafless. And to start with, I didn't think they were gonna work in my environment here in Melbourne. So we have cold, wet winters that don't freeze, and we have hot, dry summers. But on sort of reading around, they can take a cool, dry winter rest. So I thought, why not give it a whirl? Perhaps I should have waited to see if I had success with this before spending $110 on this one. But what can I do? The thing is how to look after them in winter. Of course, the funny thing with this is I was joking as I was unpacking it that I better not kill it. And what did I then immediately do? I nearly killed it so long ago. What another world it was when we were all locked down. Anyway. That one, I did lose a pseudobulb or two, and I was just very, very anxious. So this was the pseudobulb from two years ago. Last year's new growth, I killed because it got wet and it died. But I have this new growth. The only unfortunate thing is, I kind of thought I was safe, but there was a second pseudobulb and that has also just rotted. Now, I don't know. Let's see how we go. So I don't think I'm, I'm through the wilderness yet. This is all looking healthy. There's no rot on this bulb. This one has got roots. So we'll have to see if it makes it through. But anyway, goodness me. Next thing is then, why don't we look at the repotting video? So I filmed that a few weeks ago when I repotted this, which is quite late in the season. So the earliest one sent out their growth really early in spring. And then the last one, literally a couple of weeks ago. So that's quite a few months of difference between their igniting of their growth habit. And it's now midsummer in Australia. So this is quite young. It's got a lot of work to do to beef up before autumn. This one, I would say is kind of more on the, the growth path that one would expect. We're still aiming to get a really large pseudobulb from this. So it does have a lot of growing, which is why you have to feed them a lot. Anyway, let's go and look at the repotting video I made about this one. So here's our ingredients. We have some slow release fertilizer, six month release. We have my fabulous super sharp scissors, sterilized. We have a charming terracotta pot. We have our mycorrhizal fungi in a somewhat distressed packet. And we have our mix of potting medium. And this is medium sized bark, sphagnum moss, and then a mix of smaller bark pieces with various sizes of perlite all mixed in. So we're gonna mix all of this together in the pot. And then of course we have our plant. So the thing about these is that they completely go dormant over their dormancy period, lose all their leaves and all of the old roots die off. So this is really quite hard. So what I might actually do is just actually soak this so we can get all of this old sphagnum off and then see what's going on at the base of this new growth. Okay, there we are nice and moist now so we can pull apart i want to be careful about getting too vigorous around the new growth in case some of those roots have already gone down and you can see that all of these old roots are not functioning so they really are only active for one year so these plants have a lot of growing to do in that first year now this is all the moss and the material that the plant was growing in when I received it a year ago when I was so happy. So let's just get rid of a lot of that. Okay, so can you see there that fabulous new root tip? So that is what we need to engage with and we can just see. So there is all our new root tips coming out of the base of that new growth. So they are the ones we want to encourage to grow. And all of these you can see are pretty desiccated and can be trimmed off. So there you go. Now you can just leave some of the old dead roots just to give you something to anchor the plant in. It doesn't really matter. It does make it a bit easier to get stability. So luckily this is the two year old growth and the one that I killed was here. So I am very, very lucky and fortunate that this one is growing. Okay, so now we are on to potting it. So what we're going to do is put some 
sphagnum in the bottom and then a little bit of a mix of all these various things like that then we're going to put now normally i would put just a few grains and in this case though we are literally going to put in sort of half a teaspoon that is a lot of fertilizer because these plants are very <laughs> very hungry babies and have a lot of growth to do to get this to fatten up and mature in one season so lots of fertilizer in the pot adding our mycorrhizal fungi adding more of our medium popping in our orchid putting in our mix with this type of orchid i always do like to just put a lot of sphagnum moss around the new roots which are going to be moisture retaining so that it has something immediately to get its thirsty teeth into and there we go Ta-da! there we go i guess as i said the name of the game is not to water them too soon you can repot them as soon as you see the new growth and the new root emerging but just don't water it until that growth is of a good height and the roots are long enough to really be getting into the medium then you can just start watering them and then in a couple of weeks when it's a bit bigger really get into your regular heavy watering heavy feeding regime through the warm hot balmy summer as they put on all their new growth which is a nice segue, I think, to the video I made in summer when I was just basking in my <laughs> pretended glory about doing so well with them. Okay, well, it is summer central for these sort of catacetum type of orchids, although, well, they all have different names, but I feel that they all have similar growth habits. So now's a good time, I think, to have a look at them because they're all in their full summer foliage. And I'll then be able to show them to you when they have dropped their leaves and then hopefully when they flower. So this is a Fred Clarkiara. Look at the size of that pseudobulb. Oh my goodness. So this was the size that I bought it. It had these two large pseudobulbs and a couple of smaller ones. It produced this growth for me and the most amazing foliage. So I am I'm very happy with the growth of this one this year. And I feel, look at the size of that pseudobulb. I'm pretty hopeful that this is going to bloom for me. But as I said before, this is a whole sort of new group of orchids for me and I don't really have the perfect conditions for them. So we'll see. Summer's easy because it's sunny and warm and bright and I love it. But it's the rest of the year we've got to try and figure out anyway. That's that one. And this one is Fred Clarkiara After Dark Baker's Black Hole. <laughs> Oh, goodness me. Anyway, this is one of those very dark flowers. So that'll be interesting to see if I can get a bloom from that. Of course, if I do, you'll be the first to know. Then the other one doing well from this group is a Cloessia. As you can see, fantastic growth. So this is this year's growth. Not hugely mature yet. Um, so it's we're just transitioning into autumn. So I kind of would have hoped it would be a bit faster at this point of mine. These are the three previous bulbs. Um, again, I'm wondering if this is big enough and bold enough to flower. We shall see. But anyway, this growth has done really well. This is another Fred Clarkiara, and this one is called Midnight Lace, which I think is also dark. As you can see, very beautiful summer growth. The bulb is not quite as fattened as this other one, but never mind. It was a much smaller plant to start with. So I don't know. We'll see. It'd be fantastic if they bloom. Once again, the secret to these, well, I don't know, but I'm presuming because I'm only halfway through my journey with these orchids, is that in this growth phase, they are really heavy feeders and heavy waterers. So you've got to make sure the water's up and the food's up. So I feed these with a slow release fertilizer in much greater volume inside the potting mix every season than I would any other orchid type. So there we are, plant lovers my catacetum types in a nutshell what a journey it's been you never know one of them might bloom for me this year i don't know i'm managing my expectations around that but as i said at the beginning if you grow this type of orchid in a climate similar to mine i'd love to know your tricks and how you have succeeded or not and if there's anything you think that i might be missing i think i've got the growth bit right now it's really a question of getting to bloom so during summer, they like really bright, as strong light as you can get and plenty of water, humidity and food. But in winter, they can actually take cool temperatures. I just think it's a little too chilly for these. I think if I was in Sydney, a bit further north, 
they could be outside all year under cover so they weren't getting wet in winter and they do really well but here I feel it might be too cold that was my experience anyway but that could have just been because they had leaves and I got them wet and they got cold and wet and started to rot so there we are plant lovers thank you very much for watching oh, what a tangled web we have woven today anyway we'll see how we go if any of them bloom of course well, I'll be doing a follow-up with bells and whistles on it anyway. Um, my sole aim in life now is to keep this $110 orchid alive with its one cedar bulb, but one very active, healthy new growth, which is seemingly loving summer at the moment. So do leave your comments below as to how you grow these in a climate similar to mine, where it is too cold to keep them outside. i uh, love to know how you go. And I look forward to revisiting them when they're all covered in blooms, but let's not hold our breath for that. But meantime, I look forward to seeing you next week with my continuing very amateur, as you can see, orchid adventure. Take care wherever you are, and I look forward to seeing you next week.